Hello, and welcome to my spoiler review for John Wick Chapter 4, where, oh boy, do we have some stuff to talk about. But I'm warning you, we're about to enter serious spoiler territory. Okay, still here? Is John Wick actually dead? I couldn't believe it at first, but the flashback to his dead wife, who, by the way, has seriously been overshadowed by his dog all these years. I was like, oh yeah, his wife was killed too. So that really sold it. I was like, oh, this seems pretty serious. It seems like he is going to the afterlife. And then when Winston and the Bowery King are at his grave, where he's buried next to his wife with the inscription he requested earlier in this very movie, Loving Husband, written on his tombstone. And John Wick wasn't standing beside them being like, ha, we got everybody, we tricked him. And, you know, Winston and the Bowery King were so serious and sad, it did seem like he was in the ground before them. Again, I couldn't believe it. My audience couldn't believe it. We all stayed to see if there was an end credit scene. And we waited through all the credits, not just the James Bond-esque, you know, like usually what would have been the opening credits, they stuck it at the end, but through the crawl. We stayed through the crawl. And then when an end credit scene began, my whole audience audibly laughed and groaned like, ah, oh, you got us, you made us look, good one, good one. But then, to our shock, it wasn't the reveal that John Wick was still alive. Instead, we were in Paris again, and we saw that Akira had tracked Kane down with he and his daughter now both free from the high table and living their life, their best life. But now Akira was about to kill Kane for revenge for him killing her father. What? What? Haven't they been teasing John Wick 5? Is that just an impressive Andrew Garfield, I swear I'm not No Way Home style misdirect? I would actually be a little bit impressed if that was true. But, you know, I don't know, maybe in chapter five, John Wick fights his way out of hell? But it did seem like they were trying to give him some peace finally. And Keanu Reeves seemed oh so tired throughout this film. Was he acting? Is it just John Wick who's tired? Which again plays into him finally being at peace. But maybe Keanu's ready to move on to his next chapter. You know, he, you know, he kind of had his early breakout days, his, his, you know, Sandra Bullock speed days. Uh, then he moved on to the, to the Matrix. Now he's been John Wick for a while. He's got this comic book he wrote. Maybe he wants to go and do that instead. So why does John Wick's death bother me so much? It really bothers me. It bothered me as soon as it happened. It could be a bit of a personality test. I'm sure some people, you know, I guess it's if you're a, a glass half full or a glass half empty kind of person. I mean, if you're a pessimist, you're like, well, of course he died. It's poetic. One of you, as I'm about to discuss, called it bold. I really hated it. And again, I hated it as soon as it happened. But let me explain my position. And if you have the opposite position, I would genuinely love to hear your explanation down below. So if he was going to die this whole time, four movies, four movies at this point, the last one, this one almost three hours, I sat through all of that. But it makes all the death during this entire franchise, which has been substantial, seems senseless. I think, in fact, the first movie is famous for the number of kills that it features. But I'll give you one specific example from this very film, and that's the concierge. R.I.P. Lance Riddick, by the way, who tragically passed away in real life just a few days ago. But he was shot point blank at the very beginning of the movie as a repercussion for John Wick and Winston's actions at the New York Continental. I didn't think the optics on this were too good either, quite frankly. I was like, oh, so that's the one you chose to kill, huh? I mean, he didn't do anything wrong, but he was killed. And what did he die for? John Wick's death at the end of the movie and the high table still fully functioning. It's still, all, the whole operation's still up and running. Winston's gonna get a new concierge. He's getting his hotel back. I mean, it just makes the concierge's death seem pointless. And he was such a great guy. Why did they do that to him? What was the point of all of this? And I, then you might argue, well, at least John Wick freed Kane and his daughter, right? Because John Wick was too sad to go on with the loss of his dog and his wife. <laughs> now, like, I think it's supposed to be reversed. Uh, but at least Kane and his daughter are free and can still be together. But then the end credit scene makes it you know, seem that Kane also is killed. So you're like, oh, I just throw my hands up all, I mean, maybe that's the point. You're like, don't join the high table, man. This is the worst recruitment video ever made. So as you know, uh, I gave John Wick chapter four a rotten tomato on Rotten Tomatoes, particularly 
calling out the ending. And a very angry John Wick fan, as I said, left a comment on my non-spoiler review saying, well, uh, saying, saying that they felt that the ending was again, quote unquote, bold. I thought it was selfish and out of character. John Wick didn't avenge anything and ended up simply taking a lot of people with him. Think of Akira's father who sacrificed his life to keep an old friend, John Wick, alive. And then for what? He's dead anyway. I just feel the whole franchise has been about loyalty and doing what's right. But in the end, John Wick made chumps of all his friends. All of the markers he called in, he was like, I need you to do this for me. And they're like, well, if we'd known you were just going to die anyway, why did you have to, you know, go through just, you should have just taken yourself out at the beginning. All right. Now, I don't want this whole thing to be, I don't want this whole video to be like uh, a downer on the movie because it does have some good parts. So let's switch up to what I really liked about the film. And then at the end, I'll go back to some of the things I didn't care for. Paris! Ah, Paris. What a beautiful city. I love Paris. I've been there twice now, and it's a city that truly lives up to the hype. It's incredible. If you ever have an opportunity to go to Paris, take it. And I think Chad Stahelski uses the city very well here. There are three action sequences in Paris alone, each of them works of art. As Caster Choi says, it belongs in the Louvre. Face off, watch it. I don't know, I haven't seen it for a while and maybe it doesn't hold up anymore. Sometimes movies reach a point where they just don't hold up anymore. They become too dated. But there's some funny stuff in there. Uh, all right, so uh, the Arc de Triomphe, the number one, uh, se the first sequence, the first sequence. They're all good. I wouldn't put any of them above the others. Maybe the stairs is the best. All right, so the Arc de Triomphe. On my first trip to Paris, I went for a walk by myself. I took a break. I was like, I just want to experience the city. Uh, I walked around and I ended up walking around the Arc de Triomphe. The circular aspect of it, I think, contributes to this, which is why I think it's cool that they use that in the action sequence here. Because this was during the day and the sun was shining down and the sun, you know, just glistened off the exquisitely carved exterior. And because I was, again, going around in a circle and the sun was coming down, it just looked unreal. It felt like I was in a dream. It was just incredible. So I was already excited to see the Arc de Triomphe in this movie because of my own personal experience. But again, I think Chad Stahelski, even though it was a night sequence, really captured it. Hey, the Arc de Triomphe glistens under any light, thank you very much. And I can understand all the grievances that people have had in Paris lately, but it does feel, make you very sad when you see the Arc de Triomphe defaced in protest. You're like, leave the Arc de Triomphe alone, man. It didn't do anything to you. Uh, so I love that sequence. Again, I thought the circular junction was very cool about the cars racing back and forth. Perfectly blended in VFX. You couldn't really tell it was VFX. I mean, you understood it was VFX because there's no way they were going to risk their life like that. But, you know, you, it was you, you were able to suspend belief. I loved it. And you had these gorgeous cars with people in gorgeous suits. It was just a beautiful, violent dance. Absolutely stunning. Then, too, the abandoned chateau. Isn't that just an abandoned house? No, this really was a chateau. From the architecture to the way it was designed, the interior, the furniture, the wallpaper, to even when they went through the kitchen, you could see French bread and, you know, it was abandoned. So actually now I don't know why there was food in there. Maybe it wasn't abandoned. It sure looked abandoned when they were done with it because they made a mess of that place. But it was just stunning. So during the sequence, the camera moves above and looks down from the ceiling, but even above the ceiling, because it's so far away with like a bird's eye view. And it feels like a video game. You know, interestingly, James Wan also used this very effectively, yet briefly, for a sequence in Malignant, which was very, very cool. But this, this just went on for so long. But in this case, I thought it was great. I loved it. But what really made this sequence, which really, I think, put it over the top, was Dragon's Breath. I was like, is that a real ammo? It is. I looked it up. I couldn't find that brand because that was some good branding with like the actual dragon on it. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. But Dragon's Breath is a real type of shotgun ammunition that turns a shotgun into a flamethrower. And here it sparkled. It was like John Wick was shooting his enemies with pixie dust and I never got tired of it. Part of me felt maybe they shouldn't glamorize this type of ammunition, but it was incredible. I was like, ooh, sparkly. Uh, it was almost like he was using a glitter gun. You know, that was one of the cooler sequences I wonder if Ch Chad Stahelski did that. You know, he did that um, in Birds of Prey. He was brought in to add some action sequences. And so, but this was even better. This was phenomenal. And then at the end of that, John Wick jumped out the window, which you've seen from the trailers. And that was not only incredible as well, but he once again survived a multiple story fall onto, directly onto concrete. 
I mean, you could hear the thud. That suit that he wears, that special suit, is quite the literary device. And I thought it was funny at the end with the duel when he took off his uh, suit jacket and all the bullets were cl uh, clanking out. You're like, he's like, you're like, this is so ridiculous. But we're just, I, I don't mind going with it. It's a nice suit. And I believe that suit is so nice that it can protect his life. <laughs> then three, the staircase. This will be instantly famous. This will be used in like cinematic montages of action sequences, great stunt work. It's just going to become famous. It's an incredible sequence. Uh, and this is a real location in Paris, the Rue Foyatier uh, stairs, which are 222 stone steps that really do lead up to that basilica. Very atmospheric. In fact, uh, I, I, well, I, I, in one, on the one hand, it reminded me of a, a film I really love, uh, 1958's Technicolor musical Gigi, also set in Paris. Uh, and there's one sequence when they're like on a gorgeous staircase like that. I don't think it's the same staircase, but it just reminded me of that. And I was like, oh, so beautiful. Uh, and I love that this was a neighborhood in Paris. It felt neighborhoody. Uh, Paris has, you know, different, uh, what is it, arrondissements? I, for I forget the term. But I actually explored them when I was in Paris. Uh, you know, um, one of my family members had the clever idea that that would allow us to really understand the city instead of just seeing the touristy parts around the Champs-Élysées. And I loved doing that, and I'm glad that this movie did it as well. So this sequence also already became famous before this movie was even released because of the behind the scenes footage and pictures of Keanu Reeves helping the crew carry the equipment up all these steps. What a guy, what a prince. Maybe that's why he felt so, seemed so tired in the movie. This is not only a very exciting action sequence, but it's a very clever and funny one as well. Buster Keaton style comedy. My whole audience laughed and erupted in laughter and groans when John Wick fell back down the stairs once he'd almost reached the top and fell down to the very bottom, right back to, to square one. But then for Donnie Yen to step forward and join him as they fight their way back up side by side, that was incredible. And to have Donnie Yen be a part of this sequence, you have, it's just incredible. And you know, Keanu Reeves has become an action legend at this point as well, because he does almost all of his own stunts in these movies. It was reminding you of a famous dance sequence, like those of Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly. It was that good. This all led to that big finale, the duel at the Basilica, again, in, at the top of the stairs in the movie and in real life. You know, often in, lo uh, in movies, they'll pretend locations are close together when in fact they're nothing but but you could actually do a John Wick tour of Paris. Somebody do that, that would be so fun. But uh, I enjoyed the duel up until the end when John Wick died, but it was a duel for John Wick's freedom where the Marquis had insisted, forced Donnie Yen to take his place in the duel or as he continued to threaten again and again, he'd kill Donnie Yen's daughter. And I loved when he did that for the final time, Donnie Yen lost his temper and said F you to the Marquis. And he delivered, Donnie Yen delivered that line Perfectly. I felt that. It was fantastic. It was so, so good. And I too caught that John Wick had not fired his bullet. Did you get it? I got it. Uh, giving him the opportunity to shoot the Marquis, who, thinking John Wick had fired and therefore had no, uh, no way to defend himself, the Marquis then, the coward that he was, I forgot what Winston called him, but he demanded to step back in. He freed Donnie Yen and his daughter. Uh, he demanded to step back in so he could deliver the death shot only to then be taken out with no repercussions because it was in the rules of the duel. The high table is so stupid. We'll talk about them in a moment. But as for my favorite characters, again, even though I felt bad that the tracker, AKA Mr. Nobody, didn't get to wear a cool suit like everyone else, I was like, why doesn't he get a nice suit? Uh, and again, I also wondered why you know, where that dog came from. I was like, it looks like one of Halle Berry's dogs from the last chapter. Do you know her? Is that one of the dogs? They didn't even change the breed. Maybe no other breed can do that kind of action. That's interesting. But he really grew on me, the tr uh, Mr. Nobody, over the course of the film. At first I was like, meh, but then as the movie went on, I was like, I love this guy. And the way he bonded with John Wick in the Chateau, when John Wick saved his dog from the Marquis' uh, number one bodyguard, with a callback again to that later on the steps. Ah, oh, I love that. Because of course, John Wick is again, more famous for losing his dog than his wife. But I love that. I thought that was great. And I loved it in the end when Mr. Nobody sat down to watch the final duel as a spectator with his dog. They had a little snack. Uh, he, his part in all of this was over. He was done. And now as more of a fan or, you know, he's, he's in it though. So he's not a fan. He's like young blood. He's like the new generation. And he got to watch two veterans in their craft. His reactions helped really make that scene fantastic. He was great. Also, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I really enjoyed Scott Adkins. Go ahead, Scott Adkins fans. Gloat, you deserve it. He did a great job. 
in his ridiculous fat suit with his metal teeth and over-the-top German accent. Did he really deal those cards like that? I was like, is that a real shuffle? That's incredible. Or is it VFX? He reminded me so much of a Bond villain, it was fun. And he got two great sequences. The card table, dealing again to John Wick and Kane, with very cool close-up shots of his card work. And then at the club! This was a spectacular sequence with the music, the dancers, and the waterfalls, and the concrete. Very German! But I felt like it never got turned up all the way, despite shots like this, which they used in the trailer, which are so cool. But for me, this scene never got above, I'd say, a 7. And that's weird, because John Wick usually rests at a 10 before going up to an 11 for the third act. So what else didn't I like? What else didn't I care for? Well, as I pointed out in my non-spoiler review, this is the very first John Wick movie where creator, creator of the character, Derek Kolstad, didn't work on the script. And I really feel his loss is, his loss is felt. The movie is too long with no strong narrative thread to pull it all together and keep us invested for such a long period of time. I think, as I said, also in my non-spoiler review, it starts to feel more like a presentation than an actual story with stakes and stuff like that. Uh, and I feel that the high table became just ridiculously bloated and too pompous. It's a difficult balance to make the high table not seem ridiculous, and I feel this movie lost its balance. It tipped over the line. I also feel the high table secretaries, this time located in the Eiffel Tower, didn't quite work for some reason. I just can't quite put my finger on why, but maybe again because I just wasn't feeling the, the high table. Partially due to the writing, partially due to the casting. Nobody on the high table side this movie was particularly charming or effective. Like in the past, they've had villains where you're like, ah, oh, that's not only a for formidable villain, but they're pretty cool. This time, it was very unbalanced, speaking of balance. All the cool, likable people were on John Wick's side, and I didn't really care for anyone on the high table side. Bill Skarsgård didn't work for me. Uh, although his, his eyes, I could see the Pennywise in it. I was like, because you know, his eyes are a little protruded. I was like, he's got crazy googly eyes. He's just the classic milk toast villain who doesn't want his do, to do his own dirty work. And I thought the silver spoon in his mouth, literally in his mouth, by I think another writer maybe, you know, I like Chad Stahelski, but that was, it was just too over, too ham handed that bit. Clancy Brown, who I also usually enjoy, just came across too TV to me. Not cinematic enough. He didn't have the elegance that you would think the high table would have. I just didn't think he was a good choice. And all this stuff with John Wick's family in Berlin did not work for me this time. It was ponderous, and it was half hard to follow, half I didn't care to make the effort to try and follow it. But in chapter three, when he visited his family, and it was with Angelica Houston at her ballerina school, that stuff was great. And I guess maybe I didn't like retreading that. I was like, we already did a great job with this, and this is subpar in comparison. Speaking of low volume action sequences, the whole opening on Osaka just did not work for me. I felt the action, again, was always at a simmer and never at a boil, with a lot of it coming across as a demonstration, as I said, rather than an actual fight, particularly in this sequence. Also, speaking of chapter three, the big fight set here reminded me so much of the set from chapter three's big finale that I didn't feel like we were in a new location. It's, again, it seemed like a repeat. If only they'd fought more in the garden. That cherry blossom shot, again, from the trailer, is so amazing. I'm like, why can't we have a cherry blossom fight? And I didn't understand why Shimazu didn't take Kane's advice to live. Perhaps, you know, he'd revealed to his daughter that he was already injured. Maybe that was a fatal injury, and he was gonna die anyway, so he wanted to go out with honor. But I wish he'd explain that to his daughter so she wouldn't feel the need to avenge his death later on. Uh, that fight seemed pointless to me, even then. You know, Donnie Yen's character, Kane versus Shimazu. And it got even worse when John Wick then died in the end. I was like, what about Shimazu? He didn't need to die. Uh, I kind of agreed with his daughter at the end. To see all these friends fighting to the death just because the high table pitted them against each other, they were so far off the reservation already. You're like, you guys are not following the rules already. If you're breaking rules, why don't you just go all the way and come up with a plan together? I mean, what, how did Shimazu feel he was going to come back from this, right? He should have just gone rogue with John Wick right there. Also, John Wick's story, I mean, I can understand that maybe that wouldn't be feasible, right? The high table had them all cornered. They had stuff on them, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But that's, it's the script's job to make me feel that it's not possible, instead of me to question why we're not doing it. Uh, also, story-wise, John Wick is barely in the Osaka sequence, uh, and even when he is in the action sequence, he doesn't. He seems a little checked out. He seemed a little checked out to me. So it was weird to start the movie that way with so little of our main character. And while I loved the shot of John Wick in the desert from the trailer, you know, on a horse firing in the desert, 
The sequence seemed pointless in the actual movie and contributed to the movie getting off to an awkward start, again, in my opinion. So again, there's still some great stuff here, from characters to about an hour of downright art with the Paris sequences. But in an almost three-hour movie, the rest of it is significantly subpar, and I really hated the ending. All right, so what do you think? This is the spoiler review, so go to town in the comments down below. Do you think John Wick is really dead? Donnie Yen too? Donnie Yen's Kane? And how do you feel about all that? Do you think there will be a John Wick 5? Share your thoughts down below. Subscribe today, and if maybe it'll be, I don't know, maybe Donnie Yen won't die, and he'll be, it'll be him. Those, I kind of got the feeling they were trying to switch the franchise over to Donnie Yen, and I love Donnie Yen, but there ain't no John Wick without Keanu Reeves. John Wick. All right, share your thoughts down below. Subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.